You've probably seen these videos floating around the internet. And what does the voice say to you? Burn, kill, destroy. I'm just afraid because, you know, like, I know everything is just all pointing negatively right now, and I, I don't understand why. These videos of criminals seem to intrigue us so deeply. However, while they are interesting and help us understand the criminal's conduct, they skip over more fundamental questions. Questions like, what makes a criminal do such a thing? And what is the nature of crime? Or what part does the government play in all this? To explore this theme of power, crime, and reformation, we will be referring to the work of 20th century postmodern philosopher Michel Foucault and widely acclaimed existential novelist of the 19th century, Fyodor Dostoevsky. Dostoevsky wrote one of the most brilliant pieces of literature in 1866. The book's name was Crime and Punishment. To get the core message of this book, you must first understand the author's views on justice in society. He was exiled to Siberia for five years, and he had to face a mock execution. This will become important later in the video. In Siberia, he saw people justify their actions through the product that their actions would create, a moral theory called utilitarianism. Simply put, utilitarianism is kind of like the mathematical theory of morality. Utilitarians believe that we need to focus on the best outcome, and the best outcome is one that produces most pleasure minus pain. So let's explore this with an example. The trolley problem. Choo choo, I'm teaching ethics with memes. A trolley is hurtling down a track where there are five people tied to the rails. But you can pull this lever to redirect the trolley towards just one person, which is tied to another track. Do you pull the lever? If you were a utilitarian, you would say that killing one person is better than killing five people because it has the best outcome. This novel follows Raskolnikov, who is gripped by the tenets of nihilism, atheism, and utilitarianism. He receives a letter from his mother and is reminded of the great lengths his family is going to provide for him after dropping out of law school. His sister even goes as far as to set up a marriage for his family. This further humiliates Raskolnikov, and his despair grows, making him sell the last of his belongings, including his father's precious pocket watch, to a pawnbroker named Aliona Ivanova, who is a greedy, heartless individual who beats her sister, both verbally and physically. Raskolnikov devises a plan. Let's kill the pawnbroker for the net benefit of society. He believes that there are certain individuals like Napoleon who can transcend mere morality because of their intelligence. If one must die so others can be helped, it is always right to kill the one. A callback to utilitarianism. The crime has started. Raskolnikov gets an axe and walks to the pawnbroker's store. Entering Ivanova's room, he takes an axe and hammers it into her crown. The great irony of this act is the very person he pledges to save the abused younger sister comes into the room to find her dead older sister, and he is forced to murder her too, alluding to the fact that there are always unintended consequences for bad actions. Raskolnikov's name roughly translates to schismatic, which means division, and you will see this theme of duality consistently within this novel. He is drawn to people that repeat themselves twice, and finds himself in odd scenarios where there are two conflicting motives. In the final part of the book, he finds his redemption in Sonia, a young lady who is pure at heart but prostitutes for the sake of her poor family. Another duality is found here. While Raskolnikov justifies his actions with pride and seeks the benefit of himself in the end, Sonia accepts her crime with humility and seeks the benefit of others in her family. Now, according to St. Augustine, pride is the worst sin. Quote, pride is the commencement of all sin, and humility is the highest virtue. Quote, if you should ask me what are the ways of God, I will tell you the first is humility, the second is humility, and the third is humility. Now, we can see how Dostoevsky is pitting opposites against each other. In the end, Dostoevsky thought that the solution to crime was to be found in Christianity, the archetype of that being Sonia, telling Raskolnikov to serve his sentence. In a sense, his crime is pride, and his punishment is being humbled. Now, you can disagree with Dostoevsky's conclusion, or think it naive, but one of the themes of this novel is that you cannot get away from crime, at least psychologically. Quote, The man who has a conscience suffers while acknowledging his sin. That is his punishment. It is also a warning to intellectuals who believe that they can get away with crime through the manipulation of people and transcend morality. Raskolnikov's response, however, to those who convict him is the following. Quote, crime, what crime? My killing of a loathsome, harmful louse, a filthy old moneylender woman who brought no good to anyone, to murder whom would pardon forty sins, 
you call that a crime. Again, alluding to the theme of pride in killing or sin in general. So with Dostoevsky out of the way, we will be looking at the underlying structure of punishment. The author we will be focusing on for this topic is postmodernist Michel Foucault, particularly his book Discipline and Punish. If we were to simplify this book, which is quite difficult, it essentially states that we can understand power structures by observing how criminals are punished. In the 1700s, we see brutal, almost barbaric punishments. Foucault particularly points at a criminal who tried to assassinate the king. This criminal is first skinned with scalding pincers, then his body is filled with molten lead and other boiling substances. After all of this, he is tied to four horses going each in opposite directions. You might be thinking at this point, wow, I'm glad we got away from that kind of torturous punishment. But Foucault might say, not so fast. He points out that there has been a shift from controlling people with physically brutal punishments to instead making them conform to society through disciplining them mentally. In the 19th century, punishment becomes more civilized, where we see punishment for crime taken up by routine. We see sentences more controlling the minds of people rather than just inflicting physical pain. Think back to Dostoevsky's mock execution in Siberia. Now, why in the world would anyone sentence an execution that is last minute pardoned by the Tsar? Well, Foucault might say it's to control the prisoner's mind. It's to make them conform to societal conventions and make them grateful to the emperor again. Foucault further buttresses his proposal by exploring an idea called the Panopticon, a project made by the father of utilitarianism. The Panopticon is a prison layout to enforce behavior by using advanced surveillance tactics. Foucault, however, thinks now this extends beyond just prisons. Think about how we are constantly monitored by cameras in this society. It doesn't matter necessarily if someone is actually watching you, as long as you think they're watching you. And as long as you think they're watching, we will behave according to convention. He called this panopticism. And he thought that this is why we have so much interest in criminals because they don't conform to this rampant panopticism in this society. But this constant surveillance doesn't stop at just something like the Illuminati or the CIA watching us. We also watch ourselves and we also watch our neighbors. In other words, there is no clear source of where the power all lies. For Foucault, if there was a clear source of where the power was, that would be wonderful because we could just tear those institutions down. However, for him, this is not the case. Now, I have my problems with postmodernism that have nothing to do with the fact that they are neo-Marxist. But I think Foucault's analysis here is right. We are being monitored at every stage of our being. We are getting closer to that reality of 1984, which naturally means emotions are going to be repressed. And while I'm not a Freudian, I tend to agree with Freud when he says that unexpressed emotions will never die they are buried alive and will come forth later in uglier ways. Monitoring people is not in itself always a bad thing, but when it gets out of control, like most other things, it becomes very dangerous. So the point I want to make is that while Dostoevsky is right in saying that the nature of crimes is that they are first justified by pride, I think Foucault's analysis that there are other factors that are playing in how we behave, such as the aforementioned Panopticism shows that Raskolnikov's punishment, which is eventually just going to jail, may not be sufficient. Part of why Dostoevsky's writing is brilliant is because he shows the humanity of Raskolnikov and blurs the lines between an evil murderer and a genuine kind-hearted soul. Dostoevsky also spectacularly writes the psychological warfare in the mind of a criminal. But when Raskolnikov confesses to Sonya, the archetypal Christian, he might be playing a game in which he is participating in his own self-regulation, which is more of a societal redemption and not necessarily a religious redemption. If this is true, then do you think Raskolnikov is still seeking the benefit of himself rather than other people? And is he using the ends to justify his means rather than seeking a virtue in itself? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Have a beautiful day and see you soon.